Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. Today I have Tom Campbell with me. This is going to be a great show. We're going to have some fun today because we're going to respond to some of the things that um, that people were questioning after our last show. Now, the last show that we did, we decided that we put a few of my YouTube um, videos with Tom on his YouTube station. Tom has a great amount of information for everybody who... Um, who would like to know more about quantum physics and more about what we discuss. Now he brings in more of his theories. He is a quantum physicist, a nuclear physicist. He has written a series of books called My Big Toe, which is the theory of everything. And My Big Toe would be his website. He also has a forum where you can ask lots of questions. And again, recently, Three of my videos have been put up onto Tom's YouTube station. You can get more of our videos on my YouTube station or just by going to my website, intuitivesoul.com. All the latest ones of Tom, I think there's eight or nine, um, have YouTube um, videos that you can watch. And we've been doing this for quite a long time. So we've got a lot of audios as well. I think there's well over... I don't know, there's well over 30 different audios where we discuss different topics. Um, when I was with CBS, we kind of got interrupted a lot. So we kind of like this format a lot better because there's no interruptions. <laughs> I might not be able to get any, any questions in, but that's okay because that's Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Lori. It's a pleasure as always to be here. Always, always. Um, so, okay. So... The last show we did was about dreams, and I found it really fascinating because it was just so good. But I think all three of the shows that were put up there, one was on purpose, one was on dreams, and one was on realities, which was why we went to dreams, because you brought up something about reality that, you know, I wanted to explore further. So we have those three videos, and I think... and. As you mentioned when we discussed before the show, there's a <laughs> there's a misconception about fear, and I think I think we have t discussed this before, for sure. I mean, to me, it's a spectrum. There is love on one end of the spectrum, and everything in between moves us towards the fear. So. Is we're trying to balance out the flow of pure consciousness and pure data that is that well it's neutral but it's love it's 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 beautiful the problem is is when fear gets involved that we sort of shut down so i want to talk about that and then we'll bring in some of the specific type of topics but i think the big thing that people had issues with was trying to understand you know fear <laughs> so let's start okay. there Let's start with fear. Okay, fear is the opposite of love. As you say, you have love on one end of the spectrum and that's what we're trying to be. We're trying to become love. Love is what is good for us. Love is what we want to become. And in order to become love, you have to get rid of fear because as long as you have fear, then you're not all the love that you could be. That fear uh, is if you, you might think of it as anti-love or, uh, you know, the opposite of love. So we have to get rid of fear if we're going to grow up and become love in this reality. And that's why we're here to do that. That's our purpose. Okay, now fear creates some handmaidens that, uh, that go along and help serve that fear. And one of those is ego. Yeah. Okay, ego are all those things, well, let me just define that. Ego, okay, is awareness in the service of fear. Okay, mm -hmm. now that's how I define ego. So it's awareness, you know, you might say consciousness or awareness, uh, you know, your sense of self in the service of fear. Okay, now awareness in the service of love is not ego. 
Right. It also knows itself. It knows who it is. It has a, you know, it has awareness of self. Just awareness of self is not ego. Ego is that awareness in the service of fear. Okay. And that actually turns out not to be a different definition of ego. Sometimes people hear that and they say, oh, well, that's your own special kind of, you know, weird definition of ego. It's not the normal Freudian ego, but that's not so. It is the same as the normal Freudian ego. Freud looked at lots of people and he saw this one component. He was looking at the components of personality. And one of those components was the sense about what about me? You know, it's a sense of self. And of course he found everybody had that. Most people, that was their dominant, you know, that was their dominant mode. And he called that ego and it was about self. And he didn't realize that all of that was because those people were all very fear-based. Yes, he was right. That was normal under the sense of average. You know, it's normal. Most people are like that, but it's not good. It's not what we want to be. So his people that he talked to and looked at had a lot of fear. They were driven by fear, just as most Everybody is still today, you know, what, 100 years later from when Freud first uh, was making his observations. Um, and we still are ego driven and we're still full of fear. And that's ego. It's awareness in the service of fear. OK, the other thing that that fear creates is beliefs. OK, you believe things because you want it to be that way, because it makes you feel better, because it kind of satisfies your fear. So belief and ego are two things that fear creates. Now, there may be some belief that isn't fear created, but most of it is, okay? All the ego is fear created. So ego is about self and love is about other. If it's about love, if it really is love, then it's about other people. You know, we talk about, um, you know, unconditional love. Well, that's the only kind of love there is. <laughs> if there's condition, it's not love. It's a bargain. It's a deal. It's I'll do this if you do that. You know, if it's conditional love, it's not really love. It's fear. Well, it's a love and fear mixture of the two. I mean, we have all of that. We have love in us. We have fear in us. And we mix those things up all the time. It's that's the, that's who we are. So in any case, fear is the thing to get rid of. And when I say that, some people will say, oh, fear, that's what keeps me out of the woods at night. That's what makes me lock my door. You know, that's uh, why I don't walk around, you know, in the park at midnight because it's not safe and it's the fear keeps me safe. And then we had the, someone mention on the website, well, what about the people who are being bombed? You know, that fear, what keeps them indoor, keeps them in a hole in the ground, you know, keeps them wherever because that's fear. No, fear is never useful. Fear never helps. Fear always makes the situation worse. What keeps the people inside their house for protection or in a, in a bomb shelter when their bomb's falling is intelligence. It's, you know, it's good sense. It's not only common sense, but it's just acting intelligently. Uh, what keeps you, well, what has you locking your door at night is it makes good sense while you're unconscious sleeping. Why would you want to leave, you know, your door unlocked? Make it easy for somebody to walk into your house. At least they'd have to make a little noise to get in, which would wake you up, you see, and, and, and alert you. So that it makes good sense. And why shouldn't you walk in a park at night? Well, because you're intelligent enough to realize that walking through the park at midnight alone is probably a bad idea. You know, it's high risk behavior. So it's not that fear helps you out. You know, that being fearful makes you do good things. That being fearful just makes it all the worse. You see, if you're not fearful, but you're just intelligent, then instead of staying in the house or staying in the hole in the bomb shelter, terrified, you're just in the bomb shelter because that's the safest place to be. Instead of, you know, being, you know, terrified of people coming through your door and having nightmares all night because you're so frightened and fearful, you just lock the door because that's a sensible thing to do. Fear never adds anything positive. You see, it's always a takeaway. 
it always takes away. So if you want to go out and walk in the woods and it happens to be the, let's say, mating season for the grizzly bear <laughs> and you're in that kind of woods and the bears there are very territorial now, the male bears are very territorial during that season, then being fearful is not a good idea. Let's say you have to go walk in those woods. Now, somebody who's intelligent would choose not to walk in those woods. Not a good time. Let's wait, you know, till the season's over before we walk around in the woods today. So you, that keeps you out of the woods is your intelligence. But if you find yourself in a frightening situation, so you're in the woods and you see this big grizzly bear, fear will get you eaten. Fear will get you hurt because that bear will smell your fear and now he's an animal that preys on other animals and that's a sign that gets him going as far as attack and whatever. If you're fearful and what you do is scream and start to run, that will get you eaten because when you run, a predator will chase. You've just done all the wrong things. Or if you're fearful and you just stand there frozen, you know, like the deer in the headlights, right? The deer in the headlights stands there frozen because of fear. And what happens to the deer just stands there and doesn't run out of the road, they get run over. You see, fear is never helpful. If you're in that situation, your intelligence might save you. Maybe you'll reach in your pocket for the pepper spray, you know, or for the air horn, or you'll know that you should keep eye contact and back away slowly, or that you should not keep eye contact and you know, whatever, okay. <laughs> you'll know what to do and you can execute a plan. If you're fearful, basically you won't be able to execute as well a plan. If a person is fearful, they can't run as fast. Their muscles are tight and knotted up. They're unsure, they're panicked. They're not really focused on what they're doing. They're more likely to trip or fall down or other things, you see, because their intent isn't entirely on executing a plan. So fear, is always a problem. Fear doesn't save you from anything, from the bear, from the bombs, from the muggers in the park. It just makes it all worse. So being fearless doesn't mean being stupid. You know, if somebody says, oh, you're fearless, jump off the cliff, you know, show me you're fearless. Well, you know, you'd have to be stupid to jump off a cliff to show somebody you're fearless, you see. So it's not that fear keeps you from jumping off the cliff. Intelligence keeps you from jumping off a cliff. So anyway, that's the, that's the thing. And the kind of fear we're talking about, like fear of losing face or fear of being called a coward or fear of other sorts of things, not being liked or not being loved, that might make you jump off a cliff because you bragged about it or something and now it's showdown time and you either have to admit that uh, you know, you're a big, you know, you know full, of, full of hot air or you got to do something stupid, you know, that's what teenagers get into a lot of time, you know, uh, particularly teenage boys, they get kind of challenged into doing things that are stupid because they don't know what look like they're chicken or not able to do things. So that sort of fear, of course, just gets you in trouble. So there is no good fear. Fear is always a problem in any situation you're in. Fear doesn't help. It just makes it worse. And sometimes it can get you eaten. You see, it can, it can make it really worse. So that's the thing for the people who, who think that fear is really a good thing. It's not, you know, it, it, that's what keeps them alive is that fear. Not so. What keeps them alive is their ability to make good, intelligent decisions. And you can make better decisions when you're not panicked, when you're not full of fear. And you can do everything better when you're not full of fear. You're more coordinated, you're more intelligent, you make better decisions, you know, everything works better if you're not, you know, fearful. Right. If you're aware. that makes me think of the movie Life is Beautiful. And although it's a hard movie to watch, um, you know, what he did for his son, I mean, his son had an entirely different idea about war and what happened at that time than anybody else. I mean, he even you know, was able to play with his son as he was, you know, going to be shot. And it's, it's an interesting concept. Emmanuel Dagger, he grew up in Lebanon and uh, it was during war conflict. And he, you know, kind of grew up for a few years in um, a monastery um, for 
and you know so he you know but there's still like there are things that happen and as long as we don't take them personally as long as we can come from this space of love it, we have a different perspective on what happens exactly and when we do take things personally that's the fear you see the it's ego. the fear that makes you take it personally right. it's the fear that says well what about me you know what's that mean about me what are you saying about me if it's all about you then that's probably fear talking now that doesn't mean that that uh, if you're fearless you know, you, you don't have to think about yourself at all. You still have to pay your mortgage. You know, you still have to get up in the morning, go to work. There's a lot of things you have to do and things that, you know, you, you know, are the rational thing for you to do. It's, it, um, you know, getting rid of fear doesn't make everything rosy. You still have a life to live. You still have choices to make. That's not the point. You're still in charge, but right. fear, the point is that fear is just not helpful it never makes it better and it never you know keeps you safe it always makes you less safe because as fearful you can't react as well in a very tight situation you have people driving cars like that and they're very frightened about having accidents those people are more likely to have an accident than somebody who is aware alert sees what's going on and when that you know, dog runs in front of them or that car, you know, cuts them off. They can react quickly because they're in charge of themselves. They're not wrapped up in fear, which when you're fearful, you act slowly. Your reaction times go up. You're just not as good. So fear is always a bad, a bad idea. It's and when a, you're in fear and you're driving and you get caught up in road rage, you're more apt to get the person that is <laughs> really raging to come back at you. <laughs> That's right. That's right? exactly right. You create problems. Right. Your fear is a problem creator, right? So I say whatever the situation is, fear just makes it worse. It doesn't it doesn't help. Yes, when you need to diffuse situations, it's better that you're cool-headed, that you know what's going on. Matter of fact, we look at all the um, we're kind of out of that phase now in our in our uh in our movies, but we used to be in this uh, kind of kung fu phase, you know, mm -hmm. where there was the guy who was, you know, the great martial artist who was the master of everything. And what was it that made him so good? Why was it that he could do those miraculous things? He was fearless, right? So when the bad guys had all the advantage and were about to do something, he could do something intelligent. He could react in a way that was, you know, uh, execute the plan. He wasn't wrapped up in fear. So in all of those movies, you know, fear was the thing that made the hero the hero. You know, the lack of fear. Not having that fear is what made the hero the hero. And why all the bad guys ended up being vanquished by the hero was because they had this fear. They had this, this ego. They were easy to predict, you know, and so on. So... Yeah, I, I do hear that a lot, though. You know, fear is a good thing. We all need fear. Fear is what keeps us safe. <laughs> fear is what keeps you vulnerable. Right, right. Personally, and not just in the outside world, but fear is what keeps you vulnerable in the inside world. Right. Why are you vulnerable? Well, vulnerability has to do with feeling fearful. Something bad is going to happen to you. You feel vulnerable that something bad can happen to you. It's just fear. You get rid of the fear, you don't feel vulnerable anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't feel inadequate. Inadequate's another fear. You don't feel unlovable, unworthy, um, you know, on and on and on. All these things that are personality problems or problems with dealing with life, they're all about fear as well. It's not just bombs falling and bears in the woods, but all of your inner issues are fear-based. And that's really where we want to, that's where we really discuss this, this fear thing. It's all, if you are not a joyful, happy person who just finds life wonderful adventure, you know, if you're not a real positive person, that's because you have fear. If you didn't have that fear, you would be a joyful, positive person. And no, it doesn't matter that, you know, that you're, 
you know, your boss is, is not nice. It doesn't matter that you're not rich. None of those things matter. If you don't have the fear, you will deal with all of those things in the most intelligent way you can. You'll have a plan and you'll work with them, but you won't be miserable. It's the fear that makes you miserable. It's the fear that gives you the anxiety, the, gut, the upset, the angst, the anger, all that comes out of fear and ego and belief, which are again, the handmaidens of fear. So that's why fear is the problem. It's a problem on the outside. It's a problem on the inside. It's, um, it's the thing we need to outgrow. Right. Okay. So another comment, and I thought this was an interesting one for a ver variety of reasons, because it brings up other thoughts. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was talking about choices and saying that we don't have a choice. So some people believe in destiny or fate. In this case, it was, it was that our life path is already set out in stone by astrology. Now, I love astrology and I certainly use it as one of my tools to understand, you know, certain things that could be happening around. Um, but there are people that believe, you know, that our life has, been fated or destinied, like that mm. that we um, that we are following a certain path because it's been set out, yeah. and I think again this is probably a misunderstanding of what choices are. Choices, you know, w when we talk about choices, especially you and I, we're talking about are you choosing from a place of fear and ego, or are you choosing from a place of love? We always, I mean. Part of our whole purpose here is to be making choices. Yes. And there are a lot of people that feel that way, and it's called determinism. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, a large number of those people that feel that this is a deterministic reality, which means everything has already been scripted. Right. Everything. Not just most things or big things, but everything, every word that you say, every word that I say in response to what you say and so on, all of it's scripted. It couldn't be any other way. It has to be this way. Uh, we're just actors. We're like the, the actors on a, on a film, on a movie, you know, those that uh, the movie runs and the actors are going to do whatever's in the movie. You know, it's not like the actor can step out of the movie and do something else, you know, that's just the way it is. And they think that life is like that. And a large number of these people, you'd think, well, it couldn't be very many people. That's such a bizarre idea, right? To think of that, you say, then couldn't be too many people feel that way. But you know, there's one large group of people that feel that way. They're called scientists. <laughs> scientists believe for the most part, or at least used to believe, and most of them still do, that our reality is deterministic. And they believe that because that's what they, you know, that's what they need to believe. It's a, it's a, for a scientist to believe something other than that means there's some other force besides these natural forces. You see, there's some other thing bigger than the physical and the physical world. It's not just the mechanics. That, that comes from New, Newtonian um, what they call it, the, you know, the reality is a big clockwork, right? It's the clockwork view of reality. It's all this big set. If we knew where all the molecules and particles were and what their velocities and things and charges were at any instant, you could calculate everything else that would happen. You know, it's just a big clockwork. Well, that's silly. You know, it's not like that at all. Anybody, um, you know, living a life knows that they make choices. So this gets down to the fundamental philosophical argument. It's been an argument for probably at least you know, 2,000 years, and that's between determinism and free will. That's fundamentally what we're talking about here. So the problem that many people have here is that they don't understand what free will means. Mm -hmm. They think free will means that you get to have anything you want. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I have to get up and go to work so I can pay for my mortgage. I don't have free will because if I did, I wouldn't do that. You know, I'd play video games instead or I'd do something else. So obviously I don't have free will. That's not free will. Free will doesn't mean that you have a genie with unlimited wishes, that you get to have everything you want the way you want it. That's not free will. 
free will is that you have choices. In any one time, there are n things that you could do or mm -hmm. n things that you could say. And you get to choose which one of those n you're actually going to implement, okay? I could sit down at my computer and talk with Lori today, or I could do something else, but I choose to do this, my choice. Thank you. you see? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of choices that we make, little choices, and there are outside choices like that to sit down at your computer, but there's internal choices too, like I choose to be angry. Somebody said something. It's not that Susie makes me angry. It's that I choose to be angry at Susie because of what she said. You see, you have to take responsibility for those choices. Don't blame Susie for making you angry. She didn't make you angry at all. She said something and you have to take responsibility for your anger. And why are you angry? Because of the fear. You have fear. She said something that, that pricked one of your fears and it makes you angry. It's the fear of not being taken seriously or of being overlooked or of not getting uh, what you're due or not getting the appreciation that you deserve or the respect that you deserve or some other sort of fear of not getting what you want, which is of course fear, ego, right? That's also ego. And uh, that's the problem. So you choose to be angry. So we have all these choices. And you talked about road rage, right? If, you, if you're the one that, you know, go put your arm out the window and gives the finger and screams, then that guy that you just did that to may be putting on his brakes and looking for his gun, you see. <laughs> that may not have been a very intelligent thing to do. And your anger, but you choose that. You don't have to do that. You react that way because of who you are and because of all the fear that you have in you. That's why you would react that way. How dare you do that to me? You see, it's all about me. And that is the problem. So this, this free will thing is just about making choices that we have. Now it's even, it's even simpler than that because we have a lot of choices that we don't know we have. Right. Okay, we may have, you know, we may have a hundred choices, but we're only aware of 10 of them. Those other 10 are outside of our reality because of our beliefs. Our beliefs say it can only be this way. Therefore, choices that lie outside of our beliefs, we don't see them. They're not real to us. They're not part of our reality. True. That's like poor kids who feel like they could never go to college. Nobody in their family had ever gone to college. Right. It's just not in their reality. Going to college isn't in their reality. So they're going to graduate from high school and get a job. That's what they do. You see, it's just not, a, they don't see it as a choice they gave up. They don't see it as a choice at all. So free will is just choosing one of those things, one of those choices that we're aware of. That's our free will to do that. So yes, there's a hundred things I might do. There's only 10 that I'm aware about and I choose number six out of that 10. <laughs> That's my free will, you see. Now you're in jail and it's Christmas time and you wanna go home to the family. Well, you can't choose that, you see. That's not an option. So instead of saying the prisoner has no free will because he can't go home at Christmas time, it's just the prisoner has limited options now. He's got some new options he wouldn't have had if he wasn't in prison. He may just stay in his cell because it's safer there. You know, he has other choices to make that he wouldn't make otherwise. And there's other choices that he would have made that he can't now. So that's true when you go do anything. When you marry, when you get married, there's some choices that you would have made before you got married that are inappropriate now, you see? And some new choices that you never had before. So your choices, which I call your decision space, is always changing all the time. Every time you make choice A, that changes perhaps what you'll do next. Now, now choice B, C, and D all kind of rearrange themselves. Some choices fall off, other choices come into view. So our choices open up and close down other choices. And that's how we go through life. And by the time we've been in life a while, who we are and where we are and what we're doing is a result of all the choices that we've made. We are the result of all the choices that we've, that we've made. 
you see? So the free will is, is not some magic sort of thing that means you don't ever have to do anything you don't want. The free will is you have choices to be angry or not to be angry. You have choices to stay inside or go out, to lock your door or not, to go walk in the woods or not. These are all choices. And with a little intelligence, you can make more, you know, better choices. And with no fear, you can make the best choices. And we can look, I mean, even your example of prison. I mean, think of Nelson Mandela. I mean, he was in prison for, I mean, terrible reasons. I mean, it, it, none of it was fair, but yet he chose that time not only to get through his anger, but to move towards a place of love. We, I mean, these are our choices. It's, it's like, how do we, whenever there's an opportunity to, like whenever we feel that, I don't know, that angst or that pain or that, you know, th that desire where we're, you know, we know that we're not responding in the right way. We know we're responding from a place of, you know, a limited belief or um, an our core belief on abandonment or whatever it may be. You know, we always have that choice to sort of step back and look at that and say, okay, it's not, it's not in my best interest to maintain this. And it's, I mean, we, we have to do it, I think, initially, you know, intellectually, logically, we kind of look at the situation and become more aware of it. But then there's a point where we can completely open up ourselves to a place of love instead of seeing only those choices of fear. And it's kind of like when someone, you know, divorces you or breaks up with you, instead of focusing on, you know, they broke up with me or they left me, I mean, we don't know. We'll never know what's in that person's head as to, you know, all the things that they got triggered about and that they needed to work on and they had different choices. It didn't have anything to do with you. But we, we tend to take things so personally that we, you know, we get caught up in the justifying and the righteousness and, you know, all the things that can make us in fear. Well, it's all the things that we we do as our, um, you know, it, it's the way we deal with our fear. Right. We have fear and then we have these strategies to deal with it. Right. One of the strategies we have to deal with our fear is to blame other people. Yeah. You know, that's Susie made me angry, right? That's, it's our fear that we choose to be angry, but we have a strategy. Rather than deal with that fear, we blame it on somebody else. You know, that's one strategy. We have lots and lots of strat strategies to deal with fear. Yeah. And most people go through life basically living through these strategies for dealing with fear. You know, they, uh, well, I don't know, almost everything. You think of all the personality traits, all of the things that people do, most of that is strategy for dealing with fear. Whether they're boisterous and rude and whatever, well, that's a strategy for dealing with fear. Shy. Yeah, strategy. or whether they're shy in the wallflower, that's a strategy for dealing with fear, you see. And it may even be the same fear, just different strategies for dealing with it. So all of that is, is, uh, is fear-based. And the way you can tell whether you're being driven by fear, whether your life is driven by your fears, is... Just look at your life and say, is my life happy? Am I happy? Am I satisfied? Do I feel satisfaction and, and peace and joy with my life? And the answer is no, then you are driven by fear. Anything that's negative, your feeling of anger, anxiety, upset, um, all of those things that are negative feelings, you know, guilt, um, you know, anger, frustration, all of that has to do with fear. You don't feel any of that if there isn't any fear. And I know people kind of shake their head at that and they, you know, they think that's impossible. And there's other people who say, fear, I don't really have any fears. Well, they don't know what their fears are. Fears can be very, very subtle. Fears are deep down and all you know about is the feelings you have, you need to do this, you need to do that, you know, you need to get back, you need to be angry, you need to tell them to, you know, get out of your face, you need to do these things. Now, when I say that you are all about love and all about being positive, that doesn't mean that you're a pacifist. That doesn't mean 
that you are, you know, the rug that everybody walks over. If somebody does something to you, you just smile at them and say thank you, you know, and go on. That's not what it is about at all. You see, that's sometimes love makes you stand up and fight back. Sometimes love means you have to be violent. You see, it's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's more, it's not that simplistic. Matter of fact, people who have no fear and who are uh, beings of love or more developed in that direction, they have more personal power. They get more respect. They have a, a lot more, um, I don't know, gumption and power than people who are fearful. So if you think that fear keeps you safe because you've got this, this kind of tough, tough person attitude, you know, and you give people that look and they don't mess with you, you know, and you think that fear is, a, is kind of a safety thing, it isn't. That will attract the very things you're afraid of. It'll create problems in your life. It'll give you ulcers if you live that way. You see, it's, it's not good. If you are a very positive person, that gives you power. That gives you the power to change things. And just look at the people we know of in recent history who have made huge positive changes in whole cultures, not just in their families, but in whole cultures. And every one of them was because of the depth of their love and caring. Nelson Mandela, yes, he didn't get bitter in jail where a lesser person with more fear would have gotten angry would have gotten bitter and would have come out of that jail ready to, you know, ready to bite, right? Ready to get back, ready to get even, or ready to go hide, you know, whichever. Um, really ready to run away, but he didn't come out with any of those. He came out with solutions. We need to all live together is what he came out with, not anger. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, you know, look at all these people. These aren't people who who changed the culture because they were good with guns. They didn't change the culture because of their violence and their anger. They changed the culture because of their love. You see, love produces power, personal power. It, uh, it keeps you safe. It doesn't make you somebody else's floor mat. That's fear talking. Fear of, I'll be taken advantage of. I'll be treated like a floor mat. People will push me around if I'm love. That's just fear. See, it's all your fear. So if you're a very fearful person, then you also fear becoming love because you basically fear everything and you don't understand how love makes you powerful, not weak. You're not taken advantage of when you're love. You see, it's, it's, um, it's a difficult thing for, fear, for people to understand, but you just have to get there one decision, one choice at a time. That's what that free will of yours is for, is for making choices. And every choice you make will move you a little bit toward or away from fear, toward or away from love. You just have to make those right choices. And to make those choices toward love, you have to find those fears and get rid of them. So that's, that's how we grow up. Um, there was an interesting one again about, okay, this is it. So again, something that people misunderstand about when we focus our love outside of ourselves. This person was, well, I want to, I need to work on myself and I need to love and cherish all of me before I go outside. And again, I think that's a misunderstanding yes. of <laughs> what you're saying. Yes, it's a terrible misunderstanding. That's called narcissism. You know, <laughs> I love me. I am so wonderful. You know, I need to love. You have to love yourself before you can love anybody else. You know, we've all heard that sort of thing. And that's called narcissism. And that's really not what's meant. Because the people who say that aren't narcissistic and they're not wanting anybody else to be narcissistic. It's just they are in, they're saying something in a confusing way. What they mean to say is before you can love anybody else, you can't really dislike yourself. You know, if you think you're awful and you think you're inadequate and you think you've got nothing to offer, well, what can you give others if you feel you don't have anything to offer? You see, you're empty. If you feel very bad and negative about yourself, you're empty. 
you don't have much to give. It's only when you feel full, you know, of love and caring, whatever, that you have something to give. So that's what they're talking about. So it's not that you have to love yourself. It's that you have to not dislike yourself. Mm, that's interesting. You see, that's, that's the real key. So if you have negative attitudes towards yourself, which is saying is if you are fearful, just a minute, I will try to stop that from the background. Oh, I don't hear it. Oh, you didn't? No. Nope. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> this little mic is very directional. Okay. So that worked. Now the phone was ringing and uh, <laughs> I didn't know that you couldn't hear it. All right. So the point is, yeah, the point is that you, you have to not be negative. Right. If you say, you know, I'm unworthy, then how can you give to a relationship if you feel unworthy? You see, so it's that negative feelings towards yourself. That's what you have to get rid of. And what people do is they get this, this message. First, you have to love yourself. Oh, I need to take some time for me. You know, I'm busy. It's all about other people all the time. So now it needs to be about me. That's just ego. That's not necessarily narcissistic yet, but that's going in that direction. It's not about you in that sense, unless you're by yourself. If you're by yourself, then I guess it's just about you at that point. You know, yes, you can do what you, what feels good to you then. And everybody sometimes needs some time by themselves. That's good too. So you can think and, and, you know, you won't find those fears if you don't have some time by yourself to think. So it's not that by yourself time is bad or even wanting to have some by yourself time is bad. That's not the point. The point is, what's your intent? What motivates you? If you're motivated because of, you know, the vectors pointing to you, it's about me, my needs, my wants, what I, you know, what I think, what I, what I want, that is not love. That is fear. That is self-centeredness. That's ego. If it's about other, you see, you might think, well, I need to grow up. I need to get rid of my fear. I need to not make these choices to be angry or to be upset or to have to have things my way. And because of that, I'm going to have to spend some time by myself meditating and learning how I can do that. You see, now it's a bigger picture. It's not, I want to spend time by myself because that would feel good. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, really. Yes, you can feel good, it's fine. But if that's your purpose in life is to feel good, what do we call that? We call that hedonism, I guess. If that's your purpose in life to feel good, it won't take you very far. It's not really that there's anything evil about feeling good. There isn't. Feeling good is wonderful. Feeling good is what you get when you are love. It's just you get it by what you give, not by what you take. The feel good doesn't come from you've accumulated more stuff. You know, you've got more friends. You know, you've got people who bring you flowers. That's not what really makes you feel good. What makes it feel good is what you get to give away, who you helped, what you've been able to do to be of value to others. That really makes you feel good at a deep level. The other stuff only makes you feel good on the surface. And eventually, you end up feeling bad. You know, if you were to take all your time, say, all right, from now on, it's just all about me. You know, I'm going to go get in my bathtub and I'm going to get a masseuse in here to give me a massage and I'm going to have this and I'm going to have that. And it's all about me. Sounds like a really, really wealthy person, right? <laughs> Everything's going to be about me. And uh, you will find very quickly that that's a very empty, unhappy place to be because that's not where your joy comes from. Your joy doesn't come from having your back rubbed. Your joy comes from doing something useful for somebody else, for being, for giving to other people. That's what really makes you happy. And you may have all the attention lavished on you for whatever reason, because people like you or because you're wealthy or whatever, and you can pay them to like you, but that won't make you happy. What makes you happy is what can you give? Because if you're not giving anything back, if you're not being of any value to others, then you feel failed. You feel like that's, you're not doing it right. You're, you're unhappy and getting more stuff won't make you any happier. 
So that's the deal, you see. So if it's all about you, oh, just a little time for me. I got to love myself first. That's not the path to where you want to go. That may not be harmful. You may do that for a while. It may be a good little rest. Everybody needs some R&R. &R. No problem there. But you can't make that the point of your life. You can't make that your focus. Your focus has to be, this is just going to charge me up so I can go back out there and be better for others. Yes, all right. Now you've got the right attitude for it. Now go get in your bath and luxuriate and get your massage because now you have the right attitude, the right intent. You're trying to get better, feel better, so that you can go out and be better, you know, with other people, not because it's all about you. So it's not the thing. Morality and doing things that are right as opposed to wrong don't have to do with the action that we do. They have to do with the intent behind the action. So it's not whether or not you spend your tails, your, your, your time and your money on luxuriating, you know, in your hot tub. That's not the point. It's your motivation. Right. Why are you doing this and, and how does it make you feel? And, you know, what is, what's going on inside of you? It's not the act that's negative or positive, good or bad. It's the intent behind the act. Mm -hmm. So you can do almost any kind of act and have a good attitude or any kind of act and have a bad attitude. And one time the act's okay and the other one it's not. So don't get confused about actions being what's important. It's intense or what is what's really important. Now, I know you explained this, but I know that there are going to be women out there that say, but I give all the time and I give and give and give and now it's just for me. Now I'm going to take some time back for me. And well, we know that that kind of giving was based on fear instead of giving from a place of love. And even though unconsciously we truly in our hearts believed that we were giving from a place of love, we still had a belief that if we don't give, then they're going to leave us. Or if we don't give, you know, they're going to get angry. Right. Or they're, it's still based from a concept of fear. Right. If we don't, if we don't do this for them, then they won't like us. Uh, I, you know, I will feel guilty that I don't do this. I won't feel like I've done everything. You know, it's, it all gets back referenced to you again. And what happens is then you give from the intellect. You're giving at the intellectual level. You're giving because you think that's the right thing to do. I'm going to give because that's my role or that's what I should do. And I should be, it'll be a good mom. I have to do this yes. to be a good wife. I have to do this and I have to do these things. But you see, that's all intellectual. That's mm -hmm. not you being good. That's you right. acting good. And it's you acting good and resenting it. You're acting good. And I talk about unconditional love. You're acting good. But the condition is that the people are going to respond. They're going to send you flowers. They're going to smile. They're going to say, oh, thank you, mom. Thank you, sweetie. And you're going to get all this wonderful stuff back because you deserve it because you're giving, you see. That's not unconditional. That's conditional. You're acting, not being, and it's all conditional. I'll do this and I expect that in return. Well, that's not love. And that's really not giving. What you're trying to do is buy affection and buy attention by doing services. Well, I'll trade services for attention and for affection, and it doesn't work like that. You see, it's the wrong approach. So here we have doing the right thing, which is helping other people for the wrong reason, which is because of what you want and expect and demand to get back. And when you don't get it back, now you're upset. Or you're exhausted. Annoyed. Or that's exhausted. The, right? That's yeah. the bigger thing is that people are just getting so exhausted of doing everything for everybody else. And that's when they get into this thing about, well, now I have to just start doing things for me. But I do believe maybe hopefully that it's <laughs> the intent is I need to do things for me so that I can rejuvenate so that I can then uh, go from right. a place of love. Right. And that's good. And right. that's a good thing to do. Again, it's all the intent. It's not the, it's not the action. So if somebody says I need to do some things for me, that doesn't make them a bad person. It just depends on their intent of where that's going. You see, if you really care about those people and it's about them, then that doesn't drain you. That doesn't make you exhausted. You get your energy from that. 
okay, you did this for your children and now they're better off. Ah, you feel good about that. You did something for your husband or your wife or your mother-in-law or somebody and now they're better off and you feel good about that. That energizes you. If you're really giving at the being level and not the intellectual level with expectations of what you get back, if it's love-based and not fear-based, that'll pump you up. And after all that giving, you feel even better than you did before you started. Sure, it was work, but work in the, that's not work, that's a work of love, right? That's something you enjoy doing. You can see the effect you're having. But if you're saying, well, the effect I want is I want people to you know, do this. I want stuff to come back at me. I want them to bring me flowers. I want them to tell me how much they love me and how much they care. And that's really why I'm doing this stuff is because this is what I need. This is my fear that I'm not gonna get it. So that fear that I'm not gonna get it, I'm gonna do all this service to try to get it because that's my strategy to take care of my fear. Well, all that will lead to is frustration and upset and negativity and anger and you'll feel used and abused and you know it's unfair and you go through all this negative stuff and all of that is created by your own fear, you see? So it's your fear that creates all that negativity. So it's not the actions, yes, a lot of people, particularly females, spend a lot of time doing things for other people, but it doesn't make them happy unless they're really doing it at the being level because they want to give to those people, not because they want to get something back. And if they got into that mode of love rather than the mode of fear, they'd find that doing didn't exhaust them, it exhilarated them. At the end of the day, yeah, they're tired, really, really tired, but they're smiling, they're happy. They can just see all the difference they made in all of these lives and that lights them up because that's what they live for. You see, that's a whole different thing than saying, well, how's this equation working? Now, here's all the services I gave, that weighs this much, and what did I get back? Not much. Oh, I'm being taken advantage of, you see. All I do is work, work, work. Well, hell with that. I am gonna take some time for me for a change. It's gonna be about me because I deserve more than what I'm getting. You see, that's not the right way to go about it. So it's not the taking time for me, that's neither here nor there. It's the attitude, it's the intent that goes with it. Is it love-based giving or is it intellectual-based doing what you think you ought to do because you're, that's your strategy to, to kind of salve over the fear? Yeah. You see, that's to get you what you want. That's a manipulation. That's not giving, that's, that's a manipulation. That's, that's uh, not love, that's conditions. Love is all unconditional, or it's not really love. So that's kind of the way that works. Now we, you know, we have a hard time with that because our fears are unknown to us for the most part. Mm. If, we, if we really could see those fears, it would be obvious. People would say, yeah, I can see just what you mean. I can see how that fear pushes me around all day. But to most of us, our fears are invisible. We don't know what pushes us around all day. We have no idea. All we know is that we work and work and life sucks and it just seems to be hard and nothing works right. And um, the harder we, you know, run on that treadmill, you know, the further behind we get. And it looks like we're just serving everybody else all day. We don't get anything back. We still feel empty. We're not getting our cup full and we feel like we're filling everybody else's cup and it just isn't fair. And pretty soon we're a miserable, self-centered individual. And now, we resent the things we do. Now, okay, I fix Johnny's lunch and I do this and I do that, but you really resent it. It's not you're giving out of love, it's because you feel like you should and you have to, and it just makes you angry and pretty soon you are depressed, you see? And that's where, you know, depression comes from people really not liking themselves. Mm not being happy with themselves, not being satisfied. So that's this idea, well, first you gotta love yourself. Well, it's not love you have to do. You have to stop feeling negative about yourself. You have to stop saying, I'm inadequate, I'm insecure, you know? <laughs> I don't count. Look, I never get anything because I'm really not all that important. You have to get rid of all of that because that's all fear. 
fear that you're inadequate. You feel you're not very important. You fear that people don't really care about you. And it's that fear that's the problem. So see, it's an easy, it's a really easy thing to talk about, you know, yeah. and you and I can kind of lay it all out and say, look how easy it is. It's just fear. Just get rid of your fear and everything will be fine. Your life will be full of love and happiness and, you know, the struggle will end and you'll go to bed tired, but you'll be happy. Yeah. And uh, it's real easy to say, but it's real hard to do because we don't know about those fears and they're very deep seated. And every time we try to get rid of one of them, it, you know, they jerk us back yeah. because we get that fear. It's scary. To get rid of fear takes courage. You have to really want to do it. It's hard work and it isn't easy work. It gets easier as you do it, but it's hard work that you really have to want to do. You have to want to change yourself, want to change your attitude. And uh, how do you find fear? Look for ego. Is it about you? Then that's ego. And trace that ego back and you'll see that ego is there to serve a fear and that's the fear you need to work on so yes i i, I kind of feel always bad that i you know i talk about this like it's so simple and it's so easy <laughs> but i know it's not really that simple and easy it's easy to understand intellectually it's really hard to live it and to get mm -hmm. your arms around it and to understand how most of us go through our day pushed and pulled by our fears and by our intellects doing what we think we should do, not being who we are, not being authentic, not being real until we don't even know who we are anymore. Mm -hmm. After a while, who am I? You know, am I just this person who, you know, packs lunches and, you know, does this and does that, you know, is, is that who I am? You know, and you basically have lost track. Your intellect has taken over and you at the being level have kind of shrunk up and disappeared. And now you're on a treadmill because you can't stop because everybody expects all these things and you don't know who you are and you just need to get some time alone, I guess, to recalibrate and so on. And yes, that alone time can be very valuable if it's there for the right reason. If it's there for you to grow up and become love, it's a very valuable space to be in. Now, one last thought, because we're almost at the end anyway, and I certainly don't want to talk about politics in any way, but the thought or the question came up about, you know, having psychopaths uh, running your country. Um, and I think that that's no different than what we feel about some of our bosses or what we feel about, you know, some of the people. I mean, it can trigger fear, but it's, it's really based more on, again, we can choose. We have no idea what goes on and what, you know, choices they're making and why they're making these choices. Um, psychopath or uh, sociopath certainly has uh, certain in, you know indications of you know different behaviors but again it still comes up to our choosing and you know how we choose to see what's happening and, and whether we see it as happening to us um, or is happening you know and that we can choose to see it in a different way or perceive it in a different way that's that's right uh, you know everybody almost everybody is pushed and pulled by their fears all the time and that includes all the people in charge that includes your boss that includes you know the presidents and the premiers and the high muftis and you know the the priests and you know at yeah. it's everybody you know and the people in charge are also pushed and pulled by their fears, just the way you are. And when that fear gets really, really uh, strong, we may call that a psychopath, you know, because now that fear is so strong, it makes them dysfunctional in our society. And yes, there are a lot of people like that that we have to interact with. And some of them are our family members, <laughs> right? Some of them we have to live with, you know. Uh, some of them may even be our spouses or our children. You know, it's the way life is. But because other people are fearful is not a reason for you to be fearful. You see, if you let go of that fear, then you can also let people be who they are without taking it personally. It's who they are. Let them be who they are. You be who you are. You can be a person of love. You can be a person without fear. That's what you can be. You can't change them, but you can change the way 
you react to them. You can change the way you interact with them. Instead of struggling with them, you can live with them gracefully. You can't change them. It's not your job to change everybody in the world to make them be the way you think they ought to be. That's not it. Your job is to deal with your own fear. You see, so that's, you know, that's how that, that plays out. You know, you can't use that as an excuse. Yes, there's a lot of horrible things going on. There's a lot of horrible people. And a lot of those horrible people are in positions of power, you know, and they have power over you. And they have full of fear and ego and beliefs. And you have to deal with them because they're your boss or they're your spouse or they're, you know, your neighbor. Somehow you have to deal with them. Well, if you become love, You'll deal with them in a way that is good for you, and it's actually good for them too. And you'll notice that when you become love, all these people around you start to lighten up a bit. They start to get a little better because when you become love, you give them that vibe too. They get that. They see that, and that helps them be better. So if you want to help those people, change yourself. That's the best way that you can help them. You can't go lecture to them and tell them what it is they're doing wrong and, and why their attitude stinks. That's not going to help them at all. It'll just make that attitude worse. What you can do is become love. You can become caring and giving. That doesn't, again, doesn't mean you're stupid. So you're in a relationship and somebody beats you up every day. Well, don't say, well, I'll just become love and maybe they'll change, you see. That's being stupid. That's going out into the woods, you know, to, to hang out with the bears at a bad time. You know, that's not a good idea. Of course, don't be stupid. But you can still be love. You don't have, you're not a doormat. You're a person of love. You're intelligent. You make good choices. Somebody's beating you up. Well, don't let that happen. Go someplace else, you know, go change that. I think the no, other not thing by is... changing the other person, but change your own behavior and yes. what you're doing, you see? So it's, you know, being love isn't being stupid, just like being fearless isn't being stupid. Go on, you still need to have good sense and take care of, right. you know, yourself. Taking care of yourself doesn't have to be a ego thing. You know, awareness in the service of love is good. It's just the awareness in the service of fear that's not good. You see, so just because you have to take care of yourself and get out of a bad situation, that's good. That's not ego. That's, that's awareness in the service of love. You can't be helpful to anybody else if you're beat up. You see, so anyway, I think, it's... I think one of the problems, though, with this particular issue <laughs> is that there's so many people that will agree with you. There's so much gossip. There's so much... You know, there's so much anger, there's so much, all of this stuff is all kind of feeding into it. Mm -hmm. You know, they think they're right. And because, you know, everybody else is agreeing with them. And then so that they gossip more and they judge more and they go through. And I think that's part of that, you know, the dynamic that goes on when it's a boss or it's someone, you know, that has this high power position that will influence you or can affect you. Right. Right, because it's about you, yeah. and, you know, it is about you, you know, it's going to affect you. Well, you have different ways you can react to that. Right. It can get you angry. You choose to be angry. It can make you uh, want to get back. It can make you want to, you know, do something to them or whatever. You have all these choices. But if you just grow up, you see, you can just let them be angry. And it may still affect you because it's your boss, and your boss says, you know, I want you to go over there and stand in the corner and wear the dunce hat for the rest of the afternoon, you know, and you might find that humiliating or whatever. So you may have to deal with it still. But if you don't have your ego and fear attached to it, the dealing with it is easy. It doesn't bother you. It is, doesn't humiliate. It doesn't ruin your day. It doesn't make you angry. It doesn't upset you. You deal with what you have to deal with and you change that stuff that you really don't like. Well, you need a different job if your boss is going to treat you like that. Start making progress to get another job. Instead of getting angry at the boss, start working on another path. Do something about it. And while you're doing something about it, 
you don't have to get ulcers. You don't have to get upset. You don't have to get angry. Just say, well, this I'll have to endure until I have something else. And then you endure it. But it doesn't, you see, if you don't have the fear and the ego, it doesn't stick to you. It doesn't attach to you. It's not about you. It's them. It's about them. And if you can remove yourself from a psychopath's influence, well, that's good. <laughs> remove yourself from them. <laughs> if you can't, then you have to deal with it in a way that is not negative. Sometimes you have to accept some punishment, you know, that isn't fair. You know, with this whole idea of fair, you know, there really is no such thing as fair. That's all in our perception. It's generally, it's not fair because that's our ego and our fear that the whole thing about fair things just are and you deal with them in a way that is most love-like as far as your choices go. That's the point. So yes, we take uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, 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 Nelson in jail, right? Mandela in jail. How does he deal with it? Take uh, Victor Frankl, you know, victim of, uh, you know, Nazi uh, genocide. He and his family, I think all of his family were murdered and he didn't come out of it bitter. He came out of it better. He came out of it with better ideas. And he did not internalize that into more fear and hate and that sort of thing. You can go that path, but that's all serving fear. You see, so you, ex you, you deal with what you have to deal with. And those two men dealt with far more than most of us will ever have to deal with. Mm. And, and uh, if they can deal with all of that and come out of it whole, better than when they went in well so can we so yeah okay the boss may be you know really awful deal with it gracefully and change what you have to change change what you can control and you may not be able to control it much because that may be the only job around and you may take you a year to find another job well during that year it's just them being the way they are and you don't take it personally it's not a thing yeah it's yeah you still have to go to the office you still have to stand in the corner sometimes you still have to do these things but eh, it's life it's the way it is and you'll get through it and eventually it'll change and it'll go away and you'll go on with it but you don't let it affect you in a negative way you see that's the that's the difference so it's not that life becomes easy when you be when you become love in the sense that only nice things happen to you you know everybody you see you know wants to give you presents that's not it. There can still be tough moments in life. It's just that you can deal with those tough moments in a way that you don't come out of it negative. You deal with them with caring. You deal with them with a, with a sense of being that is irrepressible, that can't be hurt. It doesn't stick. All that, all that egomania just doesn't stick on you. It just flows around you, you know, bounces off of you, but you don't connect to it. The only way you can connect to somebody else's fear is with your own fear. If you don't have the fear, then you may be in a nasty environment, but none of it touches you. You live in a bubble outside of it. You're immune from it. So that's the place that we really need to get to. Don't let somebody else's fear drag you down by your fear. If you don't have the fear, it'll never touch you. Beautiful. Well. Another amazing show, Tom. I think this one will be a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll get a lot of responses from this one, but uh, <laughs> I, I loved it. I think it was, I think, you know, you guys asked the questions we answered. So um, I don't know if you'll like it, but I mean, <laughs> you made great points about, you know, it's not easy. We have to, the only thing we can do is to just become more conscious and aware of it. It's, it's not right. like it's easy. We wouldn't, if it was easy, we wouldn't be here on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> we would be somewhere else that is a uh, different dimension and uh, not quite so fear-based, but yeah. it is isn't correct. easy, but it is what we're supposed to be doing. Yes. That is our point for being here. The whole reason we are here in this experience is so we can make love-based choices and grow up. And as we grow up, we do really become immune to all this nastiness. It's still there because other people are the way they are. They haven't grown up yet, but we can live in it and be helpful and caring 
and not be doormats, be a very effective in changing things. You see, that's what we're supposed to do. That's the right answer. This idea of struggling with it and struggling with it and struggling with it and never seem to be able to get ahead and you're always struggling with these things, that's because you're part of them. You're struggling with them because of your own fear. If you didn't have that fear, you wouldn't be struggling. So if your life is a constant struggle, and it's because that's your fear. Otherwise, you can live in it without any struggle at all. It really doesn't touch you if you don't let it connect to you. All right. So you've been listening to News for the Heart with Tom Campbell. Again, go to his <laughs> website, My Big Toe, check on his forum, and definitely look at the YouTube because he's got hundreds of hours of video on there that you can find out all about this. We tend to look more at how to apply his theory, but uh, yeah, it's all there. So if you want more information, check him out for sure. And always love having you, Tom. You're, you're one of my absolute favorite people. So thank you as always. You're welcome. And I really enjoy being here because we do, do talk mostly about applications, about how it affects people's lives and how they interact with other people. And that's a very important part of it. Often in my, uh, in my other lives, other places, right? Uh, I'm Tom the science guy, and that's a different, you know, that's a different thing. Now we're talking about the nature of reality and uh, all sorts of other things, and that's important too. But this side is, is really the kind of the soft underbelly of, of uh, you know, the nature of reality. It's one of the toughest things to do is to find those fears, but it's what's important in the individual level. That's the key. If you can just get that one idea that uh, you know, your life really should be full of joy. It should be full of peace. You should feel satisfaction. And if you don't, don't point a finger at somebody else. You see, if you don't, it's because your fear is keeping you from being that. So, you know, that's another one of your choices. You have a choice with your free will. Do you work on that fear and get rid of it? Or you just keep on keeping on? It's another choice. Yes. All right. So we'll be back next month. No idea what it'll be about. But if you have more comments or you have more questions or you want us to look at something, let us know. All right. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Have a question for Lori and want to be on the next News from the Heart show? Drop us a line via instant feedback at bmajor.org. News from the Heart is brought to you by Intuitive Soul and is produced by Major Radio for Clear Channel's iHeartRadio and bmajor.org.